So I want to discuss with you whether or not we should be continuing to treat uh, children with metopic sin of stosis. Um, and I think this is a topic that in the larger craniofacial center is ongoing uh, since the last few years. So as we all know, there is a, a range of severity of trichinocephaly. And the earlier your metopic suture closes, the more severe the deformity will be. And actually the very first onset of the metopic suture starts prenatally at 15 weeks of gestation. And when it closes at this very early stage, you will end up with the most severe form of trichinocephaly. But all the other variants are possible depending on the timing of its closure. So when to treat, I think we all agree that the metopic ridge does not require treatment. And the mild trichinocephaly probably also doesn't require this, but how about the moderate or even the severe trichinocephaly? And if we treat it, why should we do that? For what reason? So these are four general reasons that we uh, tell parents. So it's the intracranial hypertension, neurocognition, the ophthalmology, and of course the abnormal uh, forehead shape. So um, most of the Time, most of the uh, data that I will present are based on the updated guideline that we developed in the Netherlands on treatment and management of cranial synostosis. So that's a thorough review of all available literature and it will be uh, available through Journal of Craniofacial Surgery uh, via an open access. So first of all, relating to the signs of raised pressure in trichinocephaly. There is a low level of evidence on this topic. That's, that's for sure if you review all the literature. But looking at those available for trichinocephaly before the age of one without having had any surgery, the percentages are low. Based on fundoscopy, it's as low as 2%. And on ICP measurements, it's stated to be about 8%, but it's a low number of cases. Following surgery, the numbers are even lower. So 1.5% for fundoscopy, and that's related to a reduced uh, skull growth. And with ICP measurements, it's uh, below 3%. So this is completely different if you compare it to other types of cranial synostosis. If we look to intracranial volume, and then it's measured that this intracranial volume before surgery is completely normal, although the distribution is, is altered and the frontal volume is somewhat uh, reduced. Looking three years after surgery, um, the volume is still normal if in minimal invasive surgery has been performed. But when open surgery has been performed, the volume is reduced with 6%. But in all these papers, they rarely or never encounter signs of raised ICP. Again, the low level of evidence is also true for this topic, but it all directs into a very reduced risk of raised intracranial pressure. If we go into the data of the neurocognition, and I hope that the next presenter will give us more details about this, um, then you see a big difference if you compare it to, for instance, the sagittal synostosis. So if you check for IQs below 80 to 85, which is about 9% in the normal population, you'll find that that risk is definitely increased in metopic synostosis. Related to the lower IQ, you also have twice as often behavioral issues like ADHD or autism. Then the number of raised intracranial pressure is lower compared to the sagittals. And we have to take into account that some genetic causes are being found, uh, although it's, it's rarely. But there is a general overlap with genes that are related to developmental delay. We should take into account that, for instance, papill edema um, is encountered in metopic synostosis sometimes because there is hyperopia. So you always need to exclude that to be sure that you're dealing with raised ICP and not hyperopia. So what we did in addition to these uh, studies mentioned in the guideline is we did a cerebral blood flow study using arterial spin labeling uh, in MR studies. 
We chose 36 uh, Trichono safely patients, uh, ranged between two to 18 months, and all were considered to uh, undergo surgery because of the moderate to severe phenotype. We had 16 controls around the same age and as controlled for sex. We took the CBF of the frontal lobes at three levels and also of other uh, lobes within the brain. These are the results of these, 30, uh, these 36 patients compared to the 16 controls. And if you go through all the various uh, levels of the frontal lobes, we did not find any difference in CBF between the trichinocephaly and the control patients. Also, all other uh, regions were completely similar between the patients and the controls. So we didn't find any indication based on CBF in trichinocephaly to go ahead with surgery. And this was uh, only detected in this age group up to 18 months of age. So we're at this stage not certain whether the change will occur later on. So we'll do that in a follow-up study. And this is the data for moderate to severe presentation. Looking at the ophthalmologic issues is of course very interesting in this group. Um, so we checked for visual abnormalities in children who are at least eight years of age, because only at that time is your ocular de development final. All had been treated with a frontal orbital advancement at a mean age of 11 months of age. And we included 84 patients. We had healthy controls from a general population study performed here in Rotterdam. And these are the results, and it shows the extremely high incidence of hyperopia, astigmatism, but also increased numbers of strabismus and amblyopia. So in all these children that did receive surgery, we could not reduce these numbers. It's quite high, and there is at present not a clear indication what causes this. Is this a representation of an abnormal brain? or is it something else within the eye itself? So these high numbers uh, occur despite the surgery, but again, we don't know how these numbers would have been if we didn't have the surgery. The last reason to do surgery is of course the shape of the forehead. And I think that if you have a, uh, some more experience, you'll notice that some self-correction can be observed particularly in the mild and moderate group of trichinocephaly. If you look at results being presented in literature for uh, minimal invasive or open techniques, everyone will say that the short-term results are all excellent and they usually are within the first year of follow-up. But you have to continue checking up on these patients. From five years of age onwards, you will notice some retusions of the sides of the forehead to recur again. And there's been study mentioning about 18% of these retrusions reoccurring. So I don't think it makes sense to publish any results with a one year up uh, follow up on aesthetics. You will definitely need to check these patients up to five or six years of age. So there is not even evidence that this surgery has a better long-term outcome than the conservative policy that you could also stick to. And between the various types of surgery, none of them has a superior long-term outcome. So this is just some examples of self-correction that we see and that usually takes place uh, most dramatically in the first year of life, where you see a less traumatic uh, protruding of the ridge and you see that the temporal uh, depressions are somewhat less severe. And again, it's a condition that was between moderate to severe and also lessened with time. This is a surgical uh, case. Uh, initially, the results looked fine. Uh, despite overcorrection, you see uh, when the child ages that still the temporal retusions uh, occur for some degree. It's all depending on how the parents and the patient feel, whether or not you would do surgery to correct it at the end. But I think if we're all very critical to our results, uh, we all know that it's quite common to, to see this develop over time. So should we treat or not? 
um, I think despite all this surgery, these children are prone to have issues with IQ and behavior and visual disturbances. And um, it doesn't make sense to expect that our surgery, uh, surgery has prevented any of this or lessened the occurrence. There is also no true evidence that the aesthetics in the long term are better with the surgery and no evidence that the cerebral blood flow is impaired or that raised intracranial pressure is a very important issue that justifies this major surgery in these children. Um, I do want to stress that trichinocephaly is most of the time an isolated uh, condition, but it can be part of a syndrome. And all the items I discussed here are related to the isolated cases. So we always check all these patients now for syndromic uh, causes. Um, and that is actually not a, a genetic panel on craniosynostosis, but a genetic panel on developmental delay, which uh, shows you a lot of these uh, overlap between the two cohorts. So finally, we now use in Rotterdam. So we actually discuss with parents that surgery might be indicated for the aesthetics only, and that we cannot even guarantee that it will in the long term be better given the scarring uh, that you cause and the temporal retusings that may reoccur. We do keep every child under surveillance with or without the surgery. And this is what we all check in our protocol. And by continuing uh, this study, we hope to answer finally uh, whether or not it's safe to do this kind of surgery um, and aesthetically uh, justified and ethically justified. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, um, outstanding. Presentation as usual, Irene. Um, uh, I think we'll do that um, for many reasons. Sorry, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. I think I lost you for yes. a second. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay. Uh, that was no, so it's the, the Wi-Fi. Yeah, so I think the, the literature would s support your views that um, I think for many reasons, one is that 80% of the patients uh, with metopsic synostosis are referred under the age of 12 months, so you can't do any significant cognitive assessment preoperatively and then postoperatively uh, because more, more than 50% of these children operate at the age of 12 months. Again, you, you have difficulties in assessing them until they are probably three to five years of age. And then there are a multifactorial uh, confounders in assessing cognitive outcomes. Uh, but yes, uh, I mean, you, you, you didn't mention a lot about genetic factors, uh, parental age, and other things that may also be contributory to poor outcomes. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it, it's of interest that now we do the testing on developmental delay genes, that we do find a number of cases like TLK, um, the SMAT6 is a known one, but if overall, I think it's it's like six to 7% of the cases with trichinocephaly in whom we now detect these changes. And I think with uh, the more intensified genetic screening, we will probably identify more of the ones with the developmental delays. And we can actually trace that back to the genetic cause. And I think in these cases, um, we cannot expect surgery to correct a genetic uh, genetic uh, cause. Okay, so that is Federico's question. Would you recommend surgery if a genetic cause is found? And I think uh, Irene has answered that. John Castle has asked, if you don't operate on the topic initially, what would make you change course and operate later? Well, we keep them under surveillance. So if the skull circumference uh, declines, that's something that we're uh, always really concerned about. We have them followed up by our ophthalmologist, uh, checking with fundoscopies or OCT scans whenever it's feasible. And I will do a repeat MRI scan whenever we are in doubt and doing again with the arterial spin labeling to check for any changes in perfusion. Um, and again, parents are given the option. So some of them are really concerned uh, that they fail their child if they don't do the surgery. But I think we have to be honest and 
don't say that they will put their child in jeopardy if they don't give them the surgery. So I think, I mean, speaking for my own units, uh, I think with more than uh, 50% of patients who are referred with metopic stenosis will end up having surgery. Uh, so I think there is a proportion of patients that will have surgery. And uh, even if they know that the uh, outcomes may not change, uh, the aesthetic uh, uh, appearance certainly seems to be better. I'm not sure whether any of uh, the UK craniofacial surgeons are in to give um, some feedback on this. Uh, but the idea would be that uh, the, uh, the severe trigonal cephalic uh, patients would certainly have a, an improvement, but they may not have a completely normal appearance of the, of the forehead. Yeah, and I think the interesting is that if you look at parents of these children, there's always one parent with uh, hypothelorism. Uh, and if you look carefully, the forehead is also narrow, but it's just not considered abnormal. And obviously the ridging disappears. But if you take a closer look, you will see some of these features in one of the parents. But it lessens. What you don't see in sagittal synostosis, those parents, if one is affected, is still clearly scaphocephalic. But obviously, in trichinocephaly, these head shapes, they lessen in severity. <laughs>